Hello, and welcome to the 1840 Podcast, where each month we explore a different topic balancing modern sensibilities with traditional sensitivities to give you new approaches to timeless Jewish ideas. I'm your host, David Beshevkin, and this month we're exploring intergenerational divergence. Thank you so much to our generous sponsors, Danny and his incredible wife, Sarla Turkel, for their sponsorship once again of this series. This podcast is part of a larger exploration of those big, juicy Jewish ideas, so be sure to check out 1840.org, 18FORTY.org, where you can also find videos, articles, recommended readings, and weekly emails. There was a fascinating exchange on a Daf Yomi broadcast. There's an incredible Daf Yomi, I think it's called the Eight Minute Daf by Reb Eli Stefanski. I'm not a regular listener, but I really enjoy the way that he cultivates community with his audience. I think it's absolutely incredible. He does incredible work and he really invigorates people. If you're looking for a Daf Yomi uh, podcast, yeah, I'm sure most of our listeners who do Daf Yomi have already heard of him. Absolutely wonderful, but there was a brief exchange. He does something similar that we do on 1840. He reads a lot of emails. I don't think he has a voicemail, but he does read a lot of emails, and they're always fascinating. He one time read the following email. Last week was a really rough week at home, and during a tough moment between my wife and I, she said, you care more about the daf than me. I haven't been able to watch this year since. It's funny, but it's not funny, because I spoke to some people, and a few people have this issue. So I want to address it, actually. And I don't know what to do, he says. How could it be that Daf Yomi is a source of a Shalom Bais issue? I'm at a loss. I can't believe that my learning the Daf could lead to such a negative feeling in her, but I don't want to cause her pain. What am I doing wrong? Any advice would be greatly appreciated. Shkoyach and Gedvach, Mr. Anonymous. So, the most I can tell you is that she is right. The wife has to feel that she is number one. She's number one. You also have to explain to her that the schar that you have in this world and in Oil Abba is split equally. And she's a part of it. Another thing you can explain to her is, like everybody else knows and says, is that the daf will make you a better husband. So it's in her benefit that you do the daf. I froze when I heard that because I don't think there is a home in the entire world. I don't think there is a Jewish home in the entire world where some permutation of that sentiment has been said. I'm not talking, of course, just about daf yomi, but the sense that I feel like I am no longer the number one priority. I feel like you are more committed, more loyal, more passionate about some religious commitment than you are to me, your spouse. And it's not always a major earth-shaking, earth-shattering issue. It could sometimes be very small. It could be somebody who wants more help maybe in the early morning with kids and one spouse wants to go to Minyan. It could be about difficulties related to Shabbos observance, difficulties related to attendance in shul, It could be a host of things for some families. I grew up with some permutation of this. It could be adherence to the Erev, which can be very difficult for young couples who are careful about who maybe don't use the Erev in a certain area, the partitions that allow one to carry on Shabbos, which would prevent somebody from pushing a stroller on Shabbos, for instance. And there are many ways, and I think there is not a Jewish home in the entire world, that some sentiment of you care more about X, and X is some religious obligation, than you do to me. And I look at that as, number one, I mean, thank God, at least they're speaking to each other. At least they're talking it out. And I don't know what this couple said to one another, but I think the sentiment is so real and is such a real part of the way our religious obligations interact with our familial connections. And obviously, it's not just with spouses. I think it's almost spoken about less with spouses. I think we've begun to talk about this more when it comes to children, that religious commitment should not erode the relationship that you have with parents. I know my mentor, Rev Moshe Benevitz, I believe, I don't want to misquote him, but I believe he tells his students before they go back to America, he teaches in an Israel yeshiva, and I believe he always tells his students that if you come home and the way you treat your parents, the way you talk to your parents, your relationship to your parents is not materially enhanced, is not obviously enhanced by your year studying in yeshiva, then you have done something wrong. 
The way that you transform after a year studying in yeshiva can't just be with your relationship with Torah. It can't just be with your relationship with Shabbos or with davening. It has to bear upon the way that you treat your own family. It can't even mean the way that you do chesed out in the world or the way you give tzedakah. I think sometimes the hardest chesed, the hardest kindness are the ones that are expected, are the ones that are almost taken for granted, should be taken for granted. And that's the family. And you come home after a year studying in Israel and the way that you talk to your parents, the way that you relate to your parents, if that is not transformed, then forget about what that says in an essential way about your religious development, but just the optics. And I don't think he was coming from the place of optics, but just looking at the optics, it is not a good sign and can lead to a very obvious chil Hashem, a desecration of God's name. This is what you come home with. This is the way you talk to me. After a year studying in yeshiva, I remember my roommate when I was in yeshiva, he lamented the fact to me that when he actually came back to yeshiva, his mother asked him to make him a cup of tea. And he he started hemming and hawing because the way that they were able to make tea on Shabbos specifically wasn't the ideal way of the way you would make tea on Shabbos. And he ended up, you know, politely declining and saying, I'm sorry, I can't make you that tea. And he lamented to me while we were still in yeshiva. He said that I didn't handle that correctly. I didn't handle that the right way, which doesn't, of course, mean that you should violate your religious principles just because a parent tells you to do something. Obviously, that's not what we're advocating. But the way that we negotiate that relationship relationship needs to be enhanced. Our religious ideals need to carry over, need to transform our familiar relationships. And obviously, maybe not obviously, that needs to be the case in our spousal relationships. And sometimes, very often, and I think this is even more common, when one spouse becomes very, maybe more passionate later in life, an awakening, and I see this all the time in the community I grew up in, somebody, you know, wakes up and is looking for more meaning, more purpose, and finds it in Torah learning and commitment. One of the spouses, Spouses can look and say, what happened to me? How is this going to affect our relationship? How is this going to affect the way that we vacation together, the way that we connect to one another? Are your religious ideals going to translate into the care, into the love that you have for me? Or, God forbid, someone could be left wondering, ever since X, ever since davening, ever since Shabbos, ever since learning Torah, it seems like you don't care about me. God forbid. And we can be left with those questions. And that's why I think it was so important to explore this topic. It's not technically intergenerational divergence. It's intragenerational divergence about how spouses negotiate religious change, religious difference within a marriage. And there are so many different permutations of this. You know, we have one example in one conversation conversation, but I think in a larger sense, any one conversation can be a window to what happens in ways big and small within all of our relationships and with all of our marriages. And it reminds me in many ways, there's this beautiful story which Tzvi Alperwitz shared with me about the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Tzvi Alperwitz uh, is the rabbi of the Chabad in Martha's Vineyard, and he shared with me this absolutely beautiful story where a Chabad chassid, I believe his name was Rev. Ruvain Dunin, he got married and he asked the Rebbe to, so to speak, be the balabais of his new home. We want to run the home according to your standards, Rebbe. And the Rebbe agreed, but he had a condition. On the condition that the behavior inside will home will satisfy, you know, my ideals and my concern. And the Rebbe clarifies, says, what I mean, what does it mean my ideals? What I mean is that there has to be shalom bias. There has to be peacefulness, serenity, kindness within the home. And a lot of times when a Rebbe tells you, you know, it has to satisfy my ideals, you would assume he's talking about the level of Torah learning, the level of piety, tzniyas, your shemayim, the amount of charity given. But no, the Rebbe said, when I say my standards and my ideals of how you run a home, I'm talking about one thing. I'm talking about shalom bias. How do you treat one another? What is the peacefulness in the home with one another? And the Rebbe in many ways modeled this. He once said it's really, really remarkable where the Rebbe used to have private tea time with his Rebbitzin. And the Rebbe one time said that he equated the importance of the tea time he had with his Rebbitzin, with his wife, on a daily basis with the obligation to put on tefillin every morning. That I need this. I need this in order to get through the day to be able to talk to my wife with kindness, with connection, with closeness. This to him was on par with putting on tefillin. It was a religious obligation. And I think that there's a sweetness to that in understanding that our religious ideals need to inform, need to elevate, need to transform our familiar relationships. And I think in other ways, our familiar relationships can transform and enhance our religious obligations. And this dialogue where they're not cordoned off in separate rooms can avoid a lot of the heartbreak and heartache that so often happens when one couple feels or maybe even our 
articulates, I'm no longer priority number one. I'm worried that ever since you stopped caring about me. And I think today's conversation, which I'm so excited to share with my absolute dearest friend, I've been working with him on a Dafyomi podcast of our own. If you've never heard, it's called Take One. It is the Dafyomi podcast of Tablet Magazine. And my dearest friend, Liel Leibowitz, reached out to me. It was a day before the CM Ashas. And he reached out to me and he said, David, we didn't know each other so well. He reviewed my book, Synagogue for Tablet. He says, David, I want to do a Dafyomi podcast with you. And I was actually bringing a group of public school teens with NCSY to MetLife Stadium to the actual CM Ashas. And he threw in one extra thing. He said, and at the end of every tractate, you can write an essay on the themes of that tractate, of that Masechta, along with the Dafyomi program. And that opportunity, I'll be honest, it was so soul nourishing. It nourishes my soul that he gave me this opportunity to share Dafyomi, to share Talmud ideas with a wider audience. It's a challenge. It's tough, but it brings me so much personal joy and has totally enhanced my learning. So I feel like he is my digital Chavrusa. He's my actual Chavrusa, and I have so much gratitude to him, but he has an incredible story, and his incredible wife, who I only met fairly recently, she was so, so lovely to speak with, Lisa Ann Sandel. She's an author herself. I spend a lot more time with Liel because we work on the Dafyomi together, but being able to sit together with them as a couple and talk about religious change, religious development, how it weighs upon at times and elevates at times the context of a marriage, it is my absolute privilege and pleasure to introduce our conversation with Liel Leibowitz and his wife, Lisa Ann Sandel. What I want to explore and talk about together is how couples navigate religious differences. Lisa and Liel, thank you so much for joining me today. What an absolute joy. Don't you steal my lines, <laughs> Liel. Don't you, don't you dare. Don't you dare. So I wanted to begin with the following question. When you got married, can you describe what your religious identities respectively were like at the point when you met one another and decided to get married? Where were you at that point in your life? Maybe we'll start with Lisa. Thanks for having me on the show. I would say that Liel and I were pretty, we were on similar pages. Liel was very clear that he had strong faith in God and I felt less certain in that respect, but I knew that Judaism was important to me. I was raised going to an Orthodox shul that was tossed out of the Orthodox Union. Kicked out for Kicked what? What was out. the infraction? <laughs> mixed seating. Okay, I was going to say, it's one of the M's, either microphones or mixed seating. It was actually both. Oh, both. Actually both. Yeah. Okay. What community did you grow up in? In Wilmington, Delaware. Okay. And the congregation was at Us Kodesh, which sadly closed its doors and oh, yeah. sold its building last year. Very heartbreaking. Very heartbreaking. We grew up going to shul every Friday night, keeping a kosher home, lighting the candles, but I wouldn't say we were observant beyond that. But it was always important to me. And also because I grew up in a community where there weren't a lot of Jews. And I went to public school. And so I was one of a very small minority so you of felt Jews. Your Jewish so I felt my Jewish up. identity very strongly. It was really important to me. I went to Israel after college to live and work for a year. And then I came back to the States and I met Liel. And when you met him, how long did you guys date before you got married? We dated for a year before we got engaged. And okay. then we had like a two year engagement. So if I were to ask Lisa, when she is in her 20s, mm -hmm. when you got engaged, you know, we're talking and I said, do you plan on keeping a kosher home? Do you plan on lighting Shabbos candles? Or did you plan on continuing the home you grew up in? Or you were already in a place where like, I feel Jewish, but a lot of the rituals you did not plan on following with in the home that you established. I expected that I would light candles on Shabbat with children, but not before that. And even before I left my parents' home, they stopped keeping kosher because the kosher butcher Aye. closed his doors and then they were trying to get meat in from Philadelphia. It was like a whole story. This is the world so my father grew up in, where you were beholden to another community to even have kosher meat. Right. And when the butcher in Philly stopped delivering to them, then they couldn't get kosher mm -hmm. meat anymore. So that's where you were when you started. And is there another wrinkle that you wanted to add to that? No, I think living in Israel... I volunteered on a kibbutz when I was in college and then was working in a magazine in Jerusalem. Like I felt very strongly about 
being a Zionist. I am and always was a Zionist, mm-hmm. and I loved Israel, but I loved secular Israel. And if somebody were to ask you again, that 20-something-year-old Lisa, a denominational question and say, what do you consider yourself? Orthodox, conservative, reform, reconstructionist? How would you have answered that in your Probably 20s? conservative. Conservative. Okay. Yeah. Liel, your story begins even in a different country. You were not raised in the United States. In a different place in a different time. <laughs> You were raised in a laboratory. No, we, you, in the world. <laughs> you were born in Israel. You grew up with fairly well-regarded rabbinic pedigree. I have zchus, as we say in French, to be the great-great-grandson of Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zonenfeld. And did you grow up knowing that? Was oh, that? it was only mentioned 300 or 400 times a week. I remember growing up, my father would tell me, we're relatives with Stacy Schiff. <laughs> She's a Pulitzer Prize winning writer. But like we grew up with that, like she's my father's, I think, first cousin, first cousin once removed. And like that was a point of pride. You grew up with, I think, an even more. Same, same, same. But I think <laughs> Yosef Chaim Zonifel played the same role in my life that I think Stacey Schiff played in yours, which is a way of my family saying, you know, that thing that we don't do? Well, there's a person out there that kind of did it for us. Because my grandmother, who was one of the oldest of 12 brothers and sisters, had left Yerushalayim behind, had traveled to Tel Aviv had lived a life that was certainly traditional, certainly not, you know, total Epicurus, but already, you know, a little bit more lax. And by the time I came around, let's just say that growing up, I was a few cheeseburgers removed from the faith of my fathers. As Lisa said, always had very strong faith. But you were thoroughly a secular Israeli. I was thoroughly a secular Israeli because I thought and believed firmly and wholeheartedly. It didn't matter what Hashem, you know, Hashem didn't want me to watch what I eat or say certain words in a certain order several times a day. He wanted me to love him and be a good person and just kind of go out there in this great big world he created and be curious about it. And it was more than enough for me. And in fact, I've dabbled in yeshivot here and there all over the place. When you say you dabbled in yeshivot, is that before you got married? Yeah. Back in Israel, you know, loving, caring cousins would say things like, hey, why don't you come and spend a week with me in, you know, my yeshiva? Why don't you come for Shabbos here? Why don't you go there? And, you know, I was grateful for their attention and learned a little bit here and there, but, you know, kind of wrote it off as, yeah, you know, that's the thing I don't do. Which is a feeling that got even stronger when I moved here to New York because here I was. I was now first a student, then a doctoral student, and you know, eventually a professor at a whole host of well-regarded universities. And I thought to myself, well, the great good, you know, the real energy, the real ruach is elsewhere. It's in studying Plato and Socrates. It's in learning Latin and Greek. It's in being this cultured man of the world. That's what a real thoughtful person does. And observance, especially you know, again, kids not yet being in the picture, felt like something that was a needlessly restrictive, kind of remote, Did unfeeling. it feel antiquated? Like, I meaning at that point, kind of like a blunt question, like Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, High Holidays, w- would that draw you back in your 20s? We have never, ever missed Kol Nidre. Ever. But even in your 20s, even in that? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, we would go. And then I remember us having very lively discussions in which I would say things. I just don't understand why there ought to be just one day of repentance every year. Like, let's go home and talk about, you know, our feelings and what we regret. But let's try to do this every day because every day ought to be Yom Kippur, which is a kind of, you know, asinine, self-confident, ridiculous thing that you could only say when you're 24 and totally carefree, right? And when you got married for you, what role did you plan on of observance having in your life going forward? Were you like, oh, we'll do Shabbos candles Friday night, kosher kitchen, or it was just like you weren't even thinking about it? To the extent that I was thinking about it, which was not often... (laughs) which is infrequently. I have to say that what came to mind is sort of bare bones minimum. I realized always, probably in some unconscious place that I would like my kids to grow up Jewish, whatever that meant. I always had a deep love for the Shabbat rituals, the candles, mirrors, etc. But I wasn't kosher. Lisa wasn't kosher. In fact, we were kind of actively, outwardly, profoundly, world historically unkosher. And so I thought, yeah, you know, I'll I'll just raise our kids the way the way we live now. They'll know they're Jews. They'll have a wonderful relationship with Hashem. They will love him and believe in him. They'll know a little bit about the tradition. They'll have all the trappings of, yeah, shul here and there and Shabbos here and there. But 
we're good. We gave it the office type of mentality. So I'm curious, and I think I want to hear this more even from Lisa's perspective than yours. Something definitely began to change or diverge. Something happened. <laughs> Something happened. <laughs> Meaning, without fast forwarding to where you are now, which is its own kind of ambiguous space, which we'll get to in a second. But tell me, Lisa, when was the first time you noticed that you and Liel were beginning to diverge religiously in terms of the past that you were on? What was the first thing that you noticed? I remember very distinctly, Liel and I went out for dinner. I would say it was about eight years ago. We went out for dinner, an Italian restaurant that we both loved and had formerly shared many dishes that were not kosher. And he said to me, I'm thinking of keeping kosher. And your first reaction to that was? Shock. And then my mind started to spin through all of these possibilities. And it felt very sort of apocalyptic. For in the real? Moment. Yeah. Like he's going to start becoming observant in this way that is very foreign to me and that I'm really not comfortable with. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think in your head, you're seeing me like, you know, Grammy Hall sees Woody Allen and Annie Hall. Like you're looking at me and all of a sudden like <laughs> I have like, Pius and a beard yeah. exactly. and a strimal exactly. I'm sitting there. Right? Yeah. And can I be more blunt? You use the word observant. Was that the fear or did you have like a latent, like the other O word, orthodox, that like he's going to become, does that association make you like uncomfortable that he would be to me they're they're the same they're the same same o word mm -hmm. and the fear of becoming observant was the toll it would take on your marriage it was that we're not on the same page anymore the restrictions the otherness what is it about observance in a marriage that can seem so startling all of it how could we possibly continue to be compatible if our lifestyles are diverging so mm -hmm. dramatically. Hold on. Let me push you from the distance of years and time as we are in a safe space here in our living room. Well, I understand the... Uh, <laughs> Liel, I, I, I have to interject. I have to interject. The witnesses can't cross one another in, in, in the courtroom. All right, Your Honor. In the courtroom of the podcast. And we'll absolutely get to some of that. I want to come back to that... Objection meal, withdrawn. To that dinner at the Italian restaurant. Were you aware at that moment when you said, I'm thinking of keeping kosher? Was it clear to you what her reaction was as she describes no, it now? Or not, you were just not, like... No, not at all. Not for a second caught me by surprise. Did you know in that moment that she felt apocalyptic? Oh, it was very evident <laughs> by her reaction that she was... But you were surprised by not her reaction. Abuse, but yeah, I mean, when, when I brought it up, my, you know, pro I don't want to call it a process. It would be dignifying it with some semblance of thought and structure, which I think all true conversions, all true processes of teshuva don't happen that way, right? They're chaotic, mm -hmm. emotionally raw, gooey, difficult processes. So I wasn't really thinking about it. I mean, I was just very absorbed by this thing that I was going through and that was going through me. I was sort of happy to share it. And like why wouldn't you be excited by this? Right. Like and you obviously didn't decide to keep kosher at an Italian restaurant when you sat down. What was going on behind the scenes that would even prompt you to think, I'm in my early 30s, late 20s. When is this? Yeah, early 30s. What was going on behind the scenes that she was clearly maybe unaware of or didn't realize how immersed you had become that you were considering, I'm going to start keeping kosher? It is so profoundly difficult for me to capture it because... Were you studying? Were you going to shoot? Like, Because it caught her by surprise. She didn't know something. Were you waking up in the middle of the night quietly and like dialing up your chavrusa and like whispering? That came later. Okay. This Murano vibe that you're describing. No, you know, look, I think if I'm rationalizing it, which is already forcing it into a pattern that is, you know, a little bit too neat to capture the true storm, I think a bunch of it came from observing the world around us change. I think a lot of the political socioeconomic turmoil that we're seeing haunt us now was evident or beginning to be evident to me back then. It did not feel like America was the same kind of radiant, sunny place it had been for me when I chose to move here from Israel in the late 90s. So a part of it had to do with that. But honestly, a part of it had to do with a much more innate inner calling, just feeling something inside, you know, going to this restaurant and feeling, it's not right for me to order the prosciutto. Why? I haven't a clue. This was before study. This was before davening. This is before everything. I just, you know, went and felt like this is something that my soul is calling out 
to me to do. Stop and you paid attention that. to it. I paid very close attention to it. Let's fast forward a little bit. Did you start keeping kosher at that Italian restaurant? Yes. Was that the beginning? Of yes. That? that was the end. That was Mid the Italian <laughs> restaurant. It was the beginning and the end. Meaning you it. showed up to the restaurant. Yep. You made the reservation, right. and midway through, they have it. Something, something changed. Hey, will we be having the shrimp scampi? Like, nope. We sat we down. Won't. We ordered a drink. We'll be having Did you salad also not tonight. order? At that point, were you like, I guess, am I not having kosher either now? Or were you like, I'm still... I don't remember in that moment. I think we did not order because we used to share food. Gotcha. I guess we're sharing a salad or... In the, <laughs> yeah. It was a long I think dinner, David. I just remember feeling very uncomfortable. We ordered vegetarian dishes and I felt uncomfortable ordering... Trafe. In front of Leo. Yeah. Specifically that in front passed of over time. Okay. That passed. Gotcha. For the record, now I keep kosher, but we can get to that. Yeah, well. Don't reveal. Don't spoil the ending. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> but for years, I did not hesitate to order trafe. Even in front of Leo. In front of Leo. Right. At that point, when you're driving home, do you have a conversation with Leo at that point? What's happening right now? Or did you both kind of like, let's don't ask, don't tell, and like just see where this takes us? I was very upset. I shut down. I did not ask him questions about like what prompted this. You know, in retrospect, I wish I had had more presence of mind to be more empathetic and curious and loving, frankly. But I was so freaked out. You were freaked out. Yeah. Now, fast forward a little bit. What happened after the kosher conversation? You shut down. When was the next time that there was a point of divergence where you both became aware that you are on different paths? There was a car trip in rural Pennsylvania or something. And all I remember is we were talking about why I'd reacted the way I did. You finally came up years later. It wasn't maybe years later, but several like months year, later. I don't know, okay. something. And I remember saying, you know, I, I just feel like it's going to snowball into you're wanting to be Shomer Shabbos and fully observant. And it feels like a path that I can't. You're one not join away you on. from a full Nanach Nachman. <laughs> yeah. I just, I felt like you were going away from me. And. I was so scared and sad and I just, I didn't know how to express myself well because the fear and anxiety was so overpowering. And I know I wasn't kind to you in that time. When you say not kind, were you derisive, like mocking to the process or you just shut down and like ignore and not be like open hearted to it? I don't think I was derisive or mocking and Leo, you can correct me if I'm wrong about that. I wasn't supportive. Did you have somebody else in your family where religion broke up a family? Because it sounds like you were like calling upon something, meaning that you would become so concerned. I know in my family, we have a close family member. You know, most of my family is not Orthodox. My father is the anomaly that we're Orthodox. And we have a family member who her either uncle or somebody became Orthodox. And, you know, it didn't really refine his character as much as we hope sometimes the movement towards observance would do it really like created this sense of like otherness betrayal like the number one goal was don't walk down that path and i'm curious for you that you had such a visceral reaction towards the journey and transformation that liel was taking what memories or like family stories was it calling upon i would say there is a very similar family story in my without my being too family, specific yeah. so you kind of had the archetype of like religion becoming a wedge in a family and watching it happen to you was calling upon all of that yeah it was it was pushing some buttons yeah did you express that to liel no i was not expressing anything i just except for fear Mm -hmm. In fact, when Liel brought up this very proposition, you said, no, it's not what this is about. Oh, you suggested this. I'm not as good a therapist as you are, but I'm, <laughs> you know, okay. I'm, a, I'm a decent apprentice. Okay. So you're in this car ride and you're having this conversation. This time you're again telling him what you're feeling. Leah, how did, what did you say? Were you able to express better what is calling you or what direction you're headed in? Or you still were at a point where it's like, it's the open road. Let me press the gas and see what happens. I'm very curious to see if Lisa would call me out on what I'm about to say as being you know way too utterly self-serving here's how i'll characterize my reaction i feel like at first i did my best to register the completely legitimate 
emotional shock that this caused and do my best to guarantee that A, I am sort of by nature, someone given to very strong feelings, but not someone given to, you know, radical world titillating kind of apocalyptic changes. And also that I believe very firmly in Darche Noam and that I thought that any kind of observance that upset the family dynamic and that tried to assert itself on other people without them being emotionally ready for it was just not my way. I feel that this was not, I was not successful at communicating it. At which point, frankly, feeling Lisa's very intense combination of anxiety and closeness, I joked before, you know, I said feeling like a Murano, but that's pretty much how I felt for years. Like I should study and daven and do this entire process completely privately. In secret almost. In secret, away from anyone else's prying eyes. And would you do that? Would you like... Yes, absolutely. Like what? Give me an example of something that you would deliberately do in private. If I knew that I had to pray chakras, I was like, I'll do it when I'm alone. I'll do it when I'm alone in the house. If I knew that I had to, not had to, wanted to study, you know, I was like, okay, well, you know, it's 11.30 at night, Lisa's asleep. Now it's time to open the safer and sit down and, and learn something. Lisa, was he a successful Murano or did you know that there was a period where he had this like dual identity? Did you ever like bust and he's like, what What's are those that marks on your, arm? on your arms? Nothing? <laughs> no, I knew. I knew. And I would say, Liel, that while my reaction sucked, I don't think you were... Much better. What did he do that could have been better? I think he was rightfully very hurt by my reaction and I think he withdrew and stopped trying to talk to me about it. To share this part of his very, life Very, very quickly. Like, it didn't take a he lot. He got the memo right away. Maybe he yeah. almost got the memo too quickly. Where, like, he's like, okay, you don't want me to share this part of my life with you? I admit to that wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. I think that's correct. And said, this is not going to be a part of my life that we are building together. Right. And you basically entered two separate rooms. And I don't think that you really made an attempt to explain anything to me. You just said, I'm going to keep kosher and... That was it. <laughs> I think that's true. Although, you know, honestly, again, in my defense, I'm a decade in. If you ask me to explain, it is so incredibly difficult for me to tell you what had happened. I mean, it's not like you read a book on kosher right. and the next morning you're like, okay, I'm going to saw a Netflix show. I'll be like, hey, this looks cool. Let's yeah. go full, you know, full black hat. No, it really was a sense of a deep, profound spiritual calling that said, do this now. And the Nasev and Ishma moment was complete. Now, Lisa, I acknowledge and apologize for this, but now I, I'm countering like a good Jew always should. Part of my difficulty to communicate it, and Rabenu Bashevkin would maybe help us resolve this thing to an extent, I felt like a lot of what I was going through was almost indescribable without being experienced. It's like, you know, there's a reason why great writers fail when they try to describe food or sex or love, because these are things that have to be experienced. And I said mm -hmm. to me, like, I can't tell you what it's like to wake up every morning, put in tefillin, daven shachris, and start your day with complete connection and gratitude to Hashem. You have to do it. Like, I could sit here and talk until, you know, the cows come home, but it's not going to make any sense when the words leave my mouth, because this Nasev and Ishma will hear and will do is, that's real. There's a beautiful idea from... Reb Tzadok, who we all knew would make <laughs> an appearance. It has been 26 minutes. It's the longest you've ever gone. But Reb Tzadok says that when we talk about our reasoning for why we do things, the language that we use in Hebrew is the ta'am, the tame hamitzos, the reason why we are doing this. The word tam also means the taste. And taste is something that is nearly impossible to share unless you imbibe it. It's almost indescribable unless it's within you and it's within your mouth and it's swishing you around and it's on your lips and a lot of times the reasoning of how we interact with commandedness or observance or Yiddishkeit or whatever word you use to describe it, it's very hard to transmit and diminish to like this is the reason, it's more like this is what it tastes like and it's very hard to transmit a taste if the other person is unwilling to look at the dish but at the same time like I appreciate the fact of like how cataclysmic religious differences can play particularly in the familial life because to me it's like you're bringing the very point of Yiddishkeit and religion to its source so it's like high volatility. Yiddishkeit is all about the family unit so if it's not aligned it can get like nuclear 
and explosive if it's misaligned. So I'm curious, was there a breaking point where either of you said enough, like almost like ultimatum, like this cannot continue? What reversed course? I'm looking at you sitting next to each other. There seems to be more calmness, more understanding. Why didn't it progress and just go on different paths? Why are you even able to talk about it today? What was the turning point that gave you each the vocabulary to have this conversation? I have an easy answer, but it's probably not the correct one from Lisa's perspective. My answer is Hashem. I, yeah, felt hurt. Yeah, probably withdrew too quickly. Yeah, went very far on my own, but never stopped. Never stopped what? Never stopped with the process. Never stopped being present and open for it, for observance, for Yiddishkeit, for love of all things Jewish. And I think it has less, or let me rephrase, nothing to do with me and everything to do with the incredible uncontestable value, right, of Judaism. I think eventually, not just Lisa, but also our children found themselves independently, perhaps despite of me or in spite of me, not because of me, drawn to it. And fast forward some years, here we are, we all keep kosher now. We never said to the kids, you must, you may not order, you know, the lobster roll. It was very important to us that it be an independent choice that they make out of love and they're still young and I can't tell you how happy and proud I am that they both made it independently. Sam, we're going to give up these things that we know, the Tom, the taste that we know and absolutely love because we understand there's a greater calling, that Judaism and observance mm -hmm. prefers a greater calling. Was it, again, in spite of me rather than because of me? To me, the real answer for this question must only lie in Lisa's memory and recollection because you charted a path for yourself and your processing. But I, I'm really curious for Lisa. It sounds like, at least in the more recent part of the story, you're the one who had to change. And I'm curious, Liel continued on this journey and you, to whatever degree, joined him or became more a part of it. What changed for you? Well, I'm going to back up a little bit and Please. counter Liel's counter and say He's that... He's a very unreliable narrator. That's why <laughs> totally. I think it's very Absolutely. important. Liel wasn't as open with me about his process and he can say it was an awakening and it's indescribable and it's hard to articulate what drew him down this path. But you did say at the beginning of this conversation that part of it was the world around you had changed. And so you started to look elsewhere for... I don't know, a center point and mm -hmm. meaning. And I think maybe if you had articulated that part of it to me early on, maybe conversations would have gone differently. I mean, that's in the past. So, okay. Okay. That's stated for the record. But moving on, I would say that the reason we were able to sustain this marriage and relationship as you were going through this process is not just because of Hashem, although I guess ultimately it is because of Hashem, but also it was the huge amount of love oh, and sure. goodwill oh, <laughs> that we feel for each other and, and the like strength of this marriage that right, was that there from explain, the get-go. I could not agree more, obviously, but how does that I don't, explain your I don't your think journey? it's obvious. How does that explain your journey? But that's journey? not what the question was at the outset. Anyway, my transition happened because I think I, later than you, reached the same conclusion about the state of the world. But also, we elected together to put our kids in Jewish day school before Liel started to keep kosher. Before mm -hmm. that was even, I think, an idea in his mind. Mm -hmm. A couple of years before you had even mm -hmm. started to entertain it. A couple of years and a couple of shekels before <laughs> yeah. I started entertaining, yeah. That was a priority. And in the beginning, in the first couple of years, when our daughter was starting at the day school, I remember feeling like this is all very foreign. This feels scary, and she's going to have all of these points of reference that are completely unfamiliar to mm -hmm. me. They had a family tefillah for the class every week, and I went every week, and I just felt very deeply uncomfortable. Did you remember the prayers from when you were a kid? Some, but Most I not. never... No, I remembered a don't alone. Okay. Oh, that's a classic. <laughs> it's a classic. That's a keeper. But I had never oh. prayed chakras. I didn't uh -huh. know the prayer. So fast forward a few years, it's like the most meaningful, beautiful part of my week. I'm so grateful for it. And I've learned alongside the kids just from going to tefillah every week with them. So I think in part learning alongside them and just becoming more familiar and, and at home with that 
aspect like with prayer has been a huge, huge, really like sea change in my life. Can you explain why did you find yourself davening for clarity or comfort in this meaning? I'm trying to figure out when this first began, you felt you use the word apocalyptic. Right. And something changed where it's not just apocalyptic. It's not just betrayal. It's not just the world is not ending, but you actually derive strength. You're shifting away from we can preserve our marriage to a place where our marriage, our family life is strengthened from this. Mm -hmm. What was the name of the highway that brought you to that discovery? You know, I don't know. I don't know that I can pinpoint. Maybe Leo was, maybe it was Hashem. I happen to like your pushback, and I was annoyed when Leo said Hashem too. But rephrasing that question of this shift, right. and you had real, it sounds like trauma might be too strong a word, or it might be the exact right word. Because I know, having come from a family where observance and orthodox is a very real scary thing, it is what tears families apart. It is the point of judgment. It's the point of we're different, we're other, we can't eat together. We can't, it's what tears at the fabric mm. of family and to be able to shift. And now you're in a place seemingly where all of this history is like paved over that you're able to actually derive strength from the very place that brought you discomfort. I'm just curious, like it's similar to Liel's awakening. <laughs> I'm struggling to find like what was the realization? What was the shift in thinking that allowed you to embrace this? I'll talk a little bit just as Lisa collects her her thoughts a little bit in defense of me and a little bit in praise of Lisa because I understand why my answers may come off as annoying lovingly annoying no no I understand that but that's the relationship I've always had with God I mean this kind of immediacy this kind of deep current of emotional personal intimate connection that has always been there for me i understand that, that is a huge privilege and perhaps an anomaly i also understand that you know most people think about things that i never once stopped to entertain i actually literally never once stopped to think about it, and perhaps that explains why i was so prickly in my response but i never actually stopped to think about there potentially and possibly being any negative real world implications to this thing because this thing to me was truth and beauty right and when truth and beauty knock on your door you don't don't ask like, wait a minute, but what will we do with the refrigerator door between sundown on Friday mm -hmm. and sundown on Saturday? You're like, hey, wow, look, it's radiant and gorgeous. I want to bathe in this, right? I understand. That's a weirdo kind of off to the side type of relation. So now back to you, Lisa. I'm curious because I, I honestly, I don't think I had anything to do with any of it. So what was it? I worked very hard for years to overcome the anxiety that this caused me because it was really all about anxiety. I was anxious that if we started to keep Shabbat, then we couldn't go travel to see my parents, or my parents would think we were weird, or we wouldn't be able to eat with my parents, or our friends would think we were weird. Mm -hmm. There's that Philip Roth story. What is it? Eli the fanatic? Right. right. Well, my friends already think I'm weird, so that's <laughs> well, that, that's not me. so far off. Yeah. But I hear, right. I hear why for you, like before you know it, you're going to pass by a mirror and you're going to be looking like you're on a shtetl. Like, wh when did this happen? <laughs> Right. So I, I really, I thought about this for years and really just worked at it and reached a point where I, I don't know, it's like I actually overcame an anxiety. How did you work at it? Is that therapy? Is that prayer? Is that meditation? Is that just like... I did all those things. <laughs> is that work on the marriage, like reminding yourself, why are we in this? It was all of it. I did do meditation. I did do therapy. I did pray. I did, you know, talk to Liel a lot. We talked a lot. You started speaking a lot about this. Mm -hmm. What would those conversations be? Would you try to find out more about his process or you would just share your anxieties and say, this is hard for me? Both. It was a lot of expressing my anxiety, but I do ask him a lot of questions now. And again, to be honest, I feel in the context of our marriage, and it's ironic since so much of what I do publicly <laughs> is talk about faith and observance, but I feel like I was completely useless to you as you know precisely because my own path has been so inflamed so you weren't useless yeah. because you've always been the man i love the man i admire and respect and you know think the world of in every capacity so once i was able to sort of work through that anxiety I could look to you as a beacon almost. Can I add in one component? And I, I wasn't sure if I was going to bring this up. And this is really directed exclusively at Lisa. 
aside from Liel being on this very exciting, imaginative, volatile religious journey, he has an added component where he's actually quite forthcoming in a public space in his writings. Not just his religious opinions, his political opinions, which can sometimes be idiosyncratic, not what you would associate with a, you know, a New York liberal Jew. And I'm curious for you if the public role of Liel, and specifically in his political views, which can be, can I use the word, and I say this with love, because we, we know we love each other, can be abrasive at times. He doesn't sugarcoat. It's not a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. He gives you the medicine and straight away, and this is what he feels you need to hear, and he says it very straight. And you could be walking around in the city with your other, maybe more liberal friends, and they're like, did you hear what your husband just wrote? Or you could overhear people talking about things that your husband's writing about, defending, aggravating, roiling up. And like, for you, like, like, in some ways, it feels like the Rebetzin, who's married to the rabbi, who gets up, gives the sermon that half the shul feels alienated by. And you're like, I didn't give the sermon. My first loyalty is to him. And that will always be the case when I'm outside the home. I love that answer. But has that ever come up where friends or acquaintances, obviously your closest friends, you know, wouldn't put you in that position where you're hearing criticism of your spouse, you know, in the social circles that you may bump shoulders with? Nobody has been critical of him to me. You know, we've definitely been with friends where people are like, what happened? Or what was that piece? And, and you've definitely been disinvited from some... Social settings. <laughs> yes, I have. You had people who have distanced yourself. Yes. Not close friends, but... But does that hurt you? You're like, I didn't do anything. like, Or that actually feels like it tests the allegiance and you're like, I'm choosing my family. Like, I'm not like... This isn't a game for you. It wasn't even. It wasn't a even question, a thought. No. I love when I see spouses not like fighting and like fighting the battles of their spouse, but like a deep loyalty where like this isn't even a choice. I'm not letting some public article disagreement like test the strength of my home. Right. There was a, a moment when there was like a political turn and it was so different from where we both were 10 years earlier. You were more liberal when you first got married, meaning we your journey, were, yes. those seem to be like somewhat intertwined. Yes. There was a moment, I think, when some of Liel's political views sort of took a lot of our close friends by surprise. And I would say, you know, this wasn't always how... I don't know what I'm trying to say, actually. Can we scratch that? No, I don't know what I'm no, saying. this is so important because what's so fascinating to me is that his political turn does not seem to have tested your resolve in the same way his religious turn has. No, it did not. Not at not all. Not at all. Not what, at all. And why is that? What would you say the distinction is? Because there was nothing about his politics that would impede the way we lived our lives. I Meaning that's not going to change the fabric of your home. Correct. But religious observance absolutely right. can and will. Right. And whatever he's writing about, like, okay, you might not be having the same, you know, ladies who lunch circle, but like, you'll get over that. That wasn't as quite as important to you. Correct. That's fair. I'm more the lady who lunches in this house, but okay. <laughs> I always know that Liel is who he is. Yes, he can be loud, but he is such a good fundamentally good, courageous person mm -hmm. that I will always know that about him no matter what he writes or says in public. I'm very struck by the difference in your affect in like the tone in which you express yourself. I find it quite charming and like compelling how you have like this, can we use the word abrasive again? We use mm -hmm. that too many times. <laughs> and there's like a softness, like just a discovery, slow curiosity. And Liel's like, this is what I want, grabs it by the neck and like, it's very sweet. It's very charming. I'm curious now, I really want to kind of open this up because this is an issue that so many people are lacking direction because there are very few couples who are willing to kind of open up. There's an intimacy to talking about differences in a marriage. And before I ask you about advice to other couples and what you would do differently, have you found a stasis now? Are there still religious aggravators that come up? And if so, what are they? I would say Shabbat is the big... Is the next frontier. The final frontier. <laughs> the, final the final frontier. Final frontier. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Do you feel like you have the skills to navigate this? Or it still feels apocalyptic I'm at the end I'm going to put it all on the table. We're sitting here. Pretty much precisely where we're sitting. Three years ago. We we're surrounded by alcohol on all sides, just <laughs> yes. so we understand what yes, this room is. Yes, we are. Yeah. And it helps. And I said to Lisa, I know your heart. I know your soul. I know your values. And I know how deeply and truly you're 
connected and passionate about all the right things. Mark my words, there will come a time and it will be in the next five years when we will be keeping Shabbat together as a family. And Lisa looked at me and said, there is no freaking way that this is going to happen. Strike that. Scratch that. It's never going to happen. I was like, okay. Me and my friend Hashem, you know, beg to differ. I don't think I'm divulging too much here when I say that last week. Lisa said, you know, I think we should, uh, we should give this thing a try. Let's give it a little go here. And I love it because it was all Lisa. Lisa, is that a fair recollection minus the frickin', which I assume was edited out because it's a family podcast? Uh. <laughs> That's pretty accurate. I'm really struggling, though. I, it really, I'm reading a lot and trying to study a lot, and I really feel moved in a way that I never felt before. But Shabbat feels very restrictive, and I'm yeah. really, really struggling with that. But I do feel like knowing that it's so important to Liel and knowing how I'm feeling at this moment in time that we should try it. And the wording I used, the way I framed it last week was, I would like to try it for a limited time and see how it goes. I think that's the best way to try anything. You know, if the reason is the taste, then you put it in your mouth, you swish it around. see what it is. You don't have to like commit to the full bowl of ice cream or steak or whatever it is. And I always say, especially with Shabbos, there's never been a more difficult time to observe Shabbos than the modern world we live in now, and there's never been a more compelling time. And I tell my students this constantly. It's like, you could place your bet on Shabbos. It is restrictive, and it is difficult, but the meaning and the purpose is amortized over the entire course and duration of your life. You'll always be getting dividends from Shabbos, and the fact that you're having these conversations still, this kind of slow and steady discovery, and it seems like you're not on separate roads you might not be on the same exact sidewalk the only thing i want to push back on is i don't fully believe you that this is framed as a concession to liel no it's not it's, i don't liel. feel like it's for liel i see it as i'm his wife i care about him i want him to be happy and fulfilled and feel like he's living his best life so it's important to me i know this is important to him so i still don't fully believe you i think there's but it's not the reason yeah. i mean if that were the reason i would have done it 10 years ago uh -huh. what's compelling you, but there's a lisa part you, of it. you exactly what's your draw my draw is the reading and the studying i've been doing has been inspiring and moving and I feel more just spiritually energized and activated in a way that I haven't before. I want to close by kind of reflecting on some of the mistakes or missteps that you've made. I'm just curious, just almost as like a yes or no, do you feel like you've forgiven Liel? And Liel, do you feel like you've forgiven Lisa for some of the tension or distance that each of your respective decisions have made? I had a percent on my end absolutely not just because i love her very much and you know care about this marriage more than anything and understand both my missteps and her anxiety but also independently or to the side of it to see lisa's own journey to be in cape cod last year <laughs> sitting in our favorite very seafood heavy restaurant and see lisa being like I'm having the salad tonight. It's astonishing. And I know she's not doing it for me or for Shlom Bais or anything like this. She's doing it because she's really opened up and, and traveled to a wonderful place. So I'm giddy. And Lisa? I don't know that there was anything I needed to forgive him for, but there's no... Mm -hmm. Let's close... I've been doing this intergenerational divergence series. This is the third year that we're doing it. A lot of people reached out on the couple's question, and there are really two types of couple dilemmas. We're covering both. One is a couple who lapses, their observance lapses, and the other is when one spouse moves closer. And this Jews, is man, it's never... <laughs> It's, it's never, never easy. It's never this easy. is obviously the latter. Both are extraordinarily common. I believe that part of what we need in this moment, in this generation right now, is more guidance, more conversation about looking at the family unit as the center, as the Kodesh Kadashim, as the heart, the inner sanctum of our religious lives, and not looking at religion and family as 
adversaries competition for attention but looking at our family life as the highest expression of our religious lives and i'm curious what advice given you know your own experiences and the mistakes that have been made what advice would you give to a couple but who someone whose spouse is moving becoming whether you want to use the word observant orthodox religion whatever word you want to use every word oh, some people are going to find either offensive or inaccurate or whatever it is but we'll use all of them what advice would you give that spouse given your own experiences of how you first handled it? My advice would be to accept your own anxiety and sit with it. And also to remember who your spouse is and the quality of their character and to try to always keep that at the front of mind ahead of the anxiety and to ask questions. That's my biggest regret that I didn't ask Liel more questions. And how did you remind yourself of that part of Liel that could have so easily have been overwhelmed and suffocated by your anxiety. Did you have any rituals? I know somebody who's quite close to me who, like any marriage, has gone through rock and they keep a picture of their spouse and tacked onto the picture are adjectives that clearly are the reasons why they love this spouse. And when I saw that in this home, it reminded me of like, this is a marriage that is putting in work to remind themselves of why are we here. I'm curious if you had a way that you reminded yourself of the Liel, of the love, of the, you know, the chesed n'urayich, that initial loving kindness that With you had for one like another. With adjectives like adequate. No. Abrasive. <laughs> no. No. I'm looking around. I don't see any pictures of Liel with adjectives. No, no adjectives. But I just, you know, watched him with our kids and mm -hmm. reminded myself to be kind and accepted his kindness back and tried to always, even if I was very worried and anxious about his path that seemed very divergent from mine, I still felt connected to him on so many other levels and tried to always stay focused on that and to just keep remembering to be kind. I want to kind of add to what Lisa's saying, which I think is very beautiful and I certainly share in spades. There's a great scene in a not-so-great movie, Lincoln by Steven Spielberg, in which a leader comes to Lincoln and says, you know, I will absolutely not stand for your kind of wishy-washy, hesitant, playing politics on the question of slavery. It is an absolute moral wrong. And we're going to go out there and we're going to say it. We're going to state it because the country needs to see and hear that this is completely wrong. And Lincoln, in Tony Kushner's brilliant moment of telling, tells this person the following story. He says, you know, my first job used to be as a land surveyor. And when I surveyed land, I would walk out there in, in the territory. And the first thing that we would do is we would look at the North Star because that's obviously how we knew where we were going. But then I learned very quickly that if you're only looking at the North Star, your chances of quickly falling into a ditch are very high. It's a great reminder of looking both at the stars above you, but also at the dusty ground underneath your feet, which I think is maybe the best advice I could give couples because I certainly messed it up. I was You were just looking at that North Star. So star heavy. Like, oh my God, look at me. I'm learning. I'm davening. I'm growing. I'm doing all these great things. But meanwhile, there's a whole relationship happening that I wasn't always as good about with Lisa shooting me incredulous looks. I'm just wondering, does that make me the dust? <laughs> no, I think the marital no, I'm kidding. I'm strife. Kidding. I get it, I get it. <laughs> I happen to really like that. I rest my That case. analogy, though, I, I take some issues with the subtle dig at the movie. I thought it was a fairly solid movie. You kind of need to consult with Wikipedia to just know everything that's happening there. But that is quite beautiful. If you get so focused on that North Star, you kind of forget the ground underneath you, mm -hmm. and you can quite easily fall into a ditch. Mm -hmm. I always end my interviews with rapid-fire questions questions. I'm curious for each of you if there is a book that you could recommend that either informed the way you navigated these relationships, the way that you navigated maybe your anxiety surrounding it. It doesn't need to be a couple's book. It could be anything, fiction, nonfiction, but a book that comes to mind that either gave you strength during this journey or helped you navigate some of the minutia, the issues that came up. Easy for me. Yeah. What is it? Synagogue by Rabbi David Bishop. Oh, stop that. I'm serious. I really appreciate Appreciate that. For the gift of Rav Tzadok alone and for your warmth and your wisdom and, and again, the willingness to not just talk about but look at failing 
<laughs> something. And it's so interesting because Reb Sadok, uh, his marriage did fall apart mm -hmm. because he was looking, I think, at that North Star. He was criticized by other Rabbanim, and I believe, a little, you know, debate, but, but I believe it's something he lived with a great deal of regret and felt that it was connected to his struggle to have children. Mm -hmm. The fact that his religious ideals impeded and eroded his first marriage. That stayed with him undoubtedly his entire life. Lisa, I'm so curious if there's a book. I would say Daniel Duranda <gasps> by George Eliot. I love that. And in a sentence, why did that come to mind? Because the revelation, I guess, spoke to me at a time when I needed to see it. I absolutely love that. If somebody gave you a great deal of money and allowed you to take a sabbatical and go back to school and either get a PhD or write a book on any topic of your choosing for as long time as you needed, what do you think the subject and title of your PhD or book would be? I think I would write about the Jews of Spain. Why the Jews of Spain? Well, my mother's family is long ago from Spain. Is she from a Converso family? I don't think so. Oh. They ended up in Russia, uh -huh. but she traced her ancestry to Spain. Fascinating. Liel? I'd write a book called How the Talmud Can Change Your Life, surprisingly modern advice from a very old book coming this October from Norton Press. Well done, my friend. <laughs> Honestly, because I live life as you mentioned publicly, abrasively, loudly, the greatest gift I could have is not writing. The greatest gift I could have, this even rhymes, it's a, it's a year at the mirror. A year it's at a the mirror. In a great yeshiva where I don't have any responsibilities and all I have to do is just learn. Nothing, nothing would be a greater gift. That is absolutely beautiful. My final question, I'm always curious about people's sleep patterns. Ah. What time do you go to sleep at night and what time do you wake up in the morning? I usually fall asleep putting my son to bed. What time is that? Like nine. Wake up around midnight, go to bed. Putter? You putter a I putter, bit? I do the dishes, yeah. whatever. And then I go to bed around 12, well, one. And then I usually, I sleep terribly and I wake up all throughout the night. I'm usually up around 3, 4, but I get up at 6.30. Wow. Okay. Spoken like a true brethren of the anxious faith. <laughs> Liel, what time do you go to sleep at night and what time do you wake up in the morning? Not anxious at all, but very late and very early. I need numbers, Liel. I'm is... cursed by very little. I need numbers. Do, you have to, do I have to ask Lisa? Lisa, what time does Liel go to sleep at night and what time do you wake up? I would say you're frequently in bed by midnight and you wake up around right. when I do. I would say before that. Mm, sometimes. <laughs> Liel and Lisa, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having us. Always a pleasure. When God creates man, there is a remarkable verse that I think many people are familiar with. When he creates humanity, he creates a spouse for the first man. And the way the Torah describes it is that man needs an Azer Kinegdo. He needs a helpmate alongside of him. And Rashi notes that it's not just an Azer, it's not just a helpmate, but there's a component of Kinegdo in adversarialness, in opposition. You don't just need somebody who's yes, yes, yes. A great spouse is somebody who challenges, who pushes back, who through the refinement of the dialogue, you're really able to uplift and create something new altogether. And there is a remarkable essay from Rabbi Sachs where he actually considers the fact that our relationship with God in many ways is compared to the relationship of a spouse. And the Jewish people and God, so to speak, have a this spousal connection with one another. And he turns to the way that the Torah describes that first spouse, the Azer Kenegdo, a help made alongside of him. Rabbi Sachs writes something that I think is so remarkable. He presents a radical possibility that God says, I will make man an Azer Kenegdo. The rabbis, Rabbi Sachs writes, who had a very fine ear for nuance, understood that this is a contradiction in terms. In Azer, is somebody who helps you, and Kinegdo is somebody who opposes you. I will make man somebody who, on the one hand, is a partner, but on the other hand, is capable of opposing him. Now, what more precise definition is there of the Jewish understanding of the relationship between God and humanity than that? We writes Rabbi Sachs, are God's Azer Kinegdo. On the one hand, as the rabbi said, we are his shutaf b'maisa beratius, his partner, his helper in the work of creation. On the other hand, we are the only beings in all of creation who are capable of being Kinegdo, of rebelling against God. Azer Kinegdo does not merely describe Eve's relationship to Adam, it describes humanity's relationship to God. 
This then creates the incredible possibility that I want to stay with you because if I'm wrong, forgive me that the words of God, lo tov heyo ta adam levado, when God says it is not good for man to be alone, are the nearest we get to God's commentary on his own being and to that ultimate question which haunts us all, which is, why did God create the universe? As long as we think of God in classic philosophical terms, that line makes no sense at all. If God is omniscient, omnipotent, platonic, Aristotelian, it's impossible to comprehend that God should lack anything. But if for a moment we could imagine that God is almost describing his own existence, ki'ilu, as if, then the reason why God created humanity like the same relationship that we see among spouses, it's both to be a partner, but also to challenge, to question, to discover, to push back, to clarify that we, so to speak, with God are his Azer Kenegdo, both a partner and also somebody who can push back, refine, critique, elevate the very notion of godliness in this world. And I think the love that can be challenged, the love that can be dissolved, the love that can be rebelled against, yet still remains intact, that spousal love, in many ways is the most powerful love, because it's the love that only exists once both parties commit. And there's this absolutely beautiful song by Shlomo Katz. It's a cover to a song by Michael Shapiro that they republish and put out in honor of Rev. Moshe Weinberger, who we've had many times on, on 1840. And it's set to this beautiful Pasuk in Yeshayahu. And the Pasuk says, Ki heharim yamushu v'hagavaos timutena v'chazde me'itecha lo yamush u'brish shlomi lo samut omar for the mountains may move and the hills can be shaken, but my loyalty will never stop, will never move from you. And my covenant will never be shaken, said God, who always takes us back in love, with love. And this is the love, the love that's created when both parties commit to one another, the love that is only created when two people come together, that covenantal love between Amcha Yisrael and God, between God and the Jewish people, that I think is what Pesach is all about. It's when Judaism stopped being a collection of individuals, of Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and we took that foundational love and became a nation. We created that bris between Amcha Yisrael, the Jewish people, not a collective of individuals, but a people, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and we became that Ezer Kenegdo, that helper alongside God in bringing that everlasting love to the world. So thank you so much for listening. This episode, like so many of our episodes, was edited by our dearest friend, Dina Emerson, while she was on an airplane, no less. It wouldn't be a Jewish podcast without a little bit of Jewish guilt. So if you enjoyed this episode or any of our episodes, please subscribe, rate, review, tell your friends about it. You can also donate at 1840.org slash donate. It really helps us reach new listeners and continue putting out great content. Thank you again to our incredible sponsors, Danny and Sarla Turkel. We so appreciate your continued support, kindness, generosity, and encouragement. You can also leave us a voicemail with feedback or questions that we may play in a future episode. That number is 917-720-5629. Once again, that number is 917-720-5629. If you'd like to learn more about this topic or some of the other great ones we've covered in the past, be sure to check out 1840.org. That's the number 18, followed by the word 40, F-O-R-T-Y dot org. 1840.org. You can also find videos, articles, recommended readings, and weekly emails. Thank you so much for listening and stay curious my friends the mountains will crumble and the hills are-